Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Michael Lewis. I'm the System Chair of Anesthesiology at the Henry Ford uh, Health System in South East Michigan. You are listening to Interview with a Surgeon with a Surgeon Agent. On this episode of Interview with a Surgeon, we welcome Dr. Michael Lewis, Chair of Anesthesiology at Henry Ford Health System. A longtime member of the American Society of Anesthesiologists, Dr. Lewis has had several leadership positions. He has served as Section Chief for Subspecialties and currently serves on the Board of Directors as Director of Academic Medicine. Additionally, he is the Chairman of the Educational Track Subcommittee on Geriatric Anesthesia and is a member of numerous ASA committees. Dr. Lewis previously served as Secretary of the ASA PAC Executive Board. He has served as a President of the Florida Society of anesthesiologists and presently as the secretary treasurer of the Michigan Society of Anesthesiologists. Dr. Lewis was recently appointed to the Michigan Board of Medicine and will serve a four-year term that will expire at the end of 2023. Hello everyone and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today we welcome Dr. Michael Lewis, Chair of Anesthesiology at Henry Ford. Doc, how are we doing today? I'm doing excellent. How are you doing? Sir? I'm doing fabulous. Thank you for joining us. So let's get this started. You know, what were your goals and aspirations during your residency? So I viewed residency as a single opportunity for me to be exposed to as many different techniques, as many different positions, and to observe what I thought was positive about those positions, what I thought was negative about those positions, and what skill sets I wanted to take away from them. And so I tried to be as open-minded as possible. I worked with people. I followed what they liked to do. And then mentally, I kind of compiled a list of what would uh, be my style when I left residency. Now, I know that you did residencies in a couple of different countries. Can you talk about what the differences was uh, in training in the United States and training elsewhere? Certainly. So um, England, I'll start with England from where I'm from, is a much more clinically based um, training, um, much less uh, high scale um, investigations. Uh, a lot of listening to the patient, examining the patient. Israel was very similar to the United States, um, but lacked the financial resources to develop and advance the practice. So um, it was good practicing in different environments because it made me appreciate both what was good about each system and again, what was uh, lacking in each system. Now taking us through the mentality, what were you going through in your first job search and how that perspective changed in the beginning years of your career? So as it happens, my first job search was the job found me. And that can happen to residents. If you um, work hard at your residency, and I was a chief resident of the largest training program in the US. And so at the end of my residency, the chair asked me, would I be interested in staying on faculty? And that is always a possibility. You, you aim to shine in your program. The other, way, the other way you can approach this is if you want to go into private practice or want to go to academic practice in a different region, is early on try to reach out to people. Say, can I come and hang out at your practice? People are much more likely to hire you when there's an emotional attachment to you, as well as the skill set. You want to have a reputation of being excellent clinically and having a mastery of the knowledge base, but I can't emphasize enough what the, the important role of emotional intelligence is. People have to see you as an expert and someone I want to work with. And I think those are very important messages. Now, throughout your career, were you academic focused all the way or did you ever consider going to a private practice? Well, again, I was offered private practice jobs and I didn't take them. And I think that's mainly because of my kind of cognitive style. My, my present position as the chair at Henry Ford is some way halfway between academic practice because we have practices here that are largely academic, Henry Ford Hospital in downtown Detroit. And then we have peripheral hospitals that are more like private practices. And so we kind of vary between the two worlds, but I would describe us as a hybrid model that is more based in um, academic practice than private practice. And I really haven't considered seriously going into private practice. What would you say were some of the keys to your success that shaped your early career as you climbed the ranks of the academic world? One was finding mentors, and I, I can't emphasize the importance of finding mentors, people who you look to both for advice and counsel and to emulate their style. And I've had mentors for all different aspects of my career. I've had clinical mentors, I've had academic mentors, I've had leadership mentors, and I've had mentors who I have learned 
positive lessons from, I want to do that. And observing them in different situations, I definitely don't want to do that. So mentorship can go both ways, but I think I can't emphasize the power of mentorship. The second thing is always be, strive to be on the cutting edge. Always strive to stay ahead of the literature. Always try and try new techniques. That will make you stand out with your, with your surgical colleagues. And again, the last thing is the emotional intelligence. Form friends with your surgical colleagues in the world of anesthesia. It's very important that surgeons trust you, see you as competent, see you as a partner. I always, always, and I encourage my staff as well, I reach out to surgeons the night before I'm working with them so we can walk into that operating room the next day with a common plan. And so they have a vested interest in, in our teamwork. Can you kind of briefly take us through your journey on how you became chair of the program at Henry Ford? Sure. So as you mentioned, I did residencies in both the United Kingdom and Israel. I then had the good fortune of marrying an American. And that's what dragged me across the ocean. I didn't have the qualifying exams, so I had to take six months to study for the qualifying exams. And then um, I was lucky enough to have a friend in Philadelphia and uh, was able to obtain an internship. Whilst I was in Philadelphia, I applied for three residency programs. The one at the host institution where I was doing my internship at the University of Pennsylvania and at the uh, University of Miami because my in-laws lived in South Florida. And one of the icons of anesthesia, Manny Papel, was in Miami. And he offered me a residency position and I took it. And I was extremely glad I did because Manny became one of my first mentors. And if you speak to anyone in anesthesia, there are two endowed chairs nationally, one at Columbia, one at Miami, the Manny Papa chairs. He was a role model for generations of anesthesiology. And I was lucky enough to interact with him. So that brought me down to Miami. In Miami, I had to be very mindful because I had done like eight years of anesthesia before coming here, not to be arrogant enough to think I knew everything. I wanted to learn. I wanted to be a resident. I was able to teach certain techniques to actually the faculty they hadn't tried before. That there was an instrument called the laryngeal mask airway, which was new in the States that we've been using for a long time in England. But on the most part, I tried to absorb from their styles. And I think I was greatly advantaged by that. I learned new styles and eventually got chosen as the chief resident. I did, even though I had children, I gave 100% to my residency whilst I was at work. And I tried 100%, which I think is a key lesson to learn, to being a father and a, and, and a husband. So I go to work with as much positive energy as I go home with. And finding that balance is so essential to find having a successful career. And so I worked very, very hard, did well in the exams, and as I mentioned, was rewarded by ask, being asked to be a faculty member at the end of my residence. So I started my career at the VA in Miami. Uh, again, I had a mentor there, Marty Gold, who got me very interested in um, education. And at the same time, I developed, in, in, in research, sorry, in research, got me very involved in research. And at the same time, I developed a deep interest in education. And went really dived into education and we got chosen as the kind of top site for education year after year in Miami. Eventually I got asked to be the chief at the VA and um, worked hard at that. But the VA is a special environment. It's a very special environment. And I couldn't see my long-term career there. And so I moved back to Jackson Memorial, which was the main teaching hospital at the medical school and joined the liver transplant team. And uh, David Lubarski, who was the chair, sent me to Emory to train in liver transplant. I did, I came back, and I went head into being a liver transplant anesthesiologist. We were doing 200 transplants a year, very, very busy service. Great relationship with my surgeons. And whilst I was there, I had a notice went out to the faculty um, to see if anyone was interested in becoming a Fulbright scholar. So I went to Dr. Lubarski and said to him, David, I'm interested in this, but the salary is crap. It's not, it's not a salary that I can support my family on. He said, you apply for it, you get it, I'll make you whole. So I applied for it. 
Um, and it was just as the, the first, uh, Second Gulf War was breaking out. And so um, they cut the State Department budget by 10%, and I never got chosen. And I accepted that. I'd applied for grants before I never got chosen. But one day, I get a letter from the State Department saying, congratulations, Dr. Lewis. You have been chosen as a Fulbright Scholar. So I was very excited. And that afternoon, I got a phone call from the State Department saying, you know the letter you got today? Yeah, it's a mistake. So now, I was somewhat upset. Now, I, what I haven't mentioned to you was I was very involved in university governance. I'd been the... Uh, chairman of the medical school faculty council and at this point in time i was the vice chair of the university senate so very involved in governance i went to the meeting and the president of the university donna shalala who had served in clinton's cabinet for eight years as health and human services came to the meeting and i gave her the letter and she said congratulations mike and i said well let me tell you about the phone call i got after the letter she said leave it with me this was on a wednesday friday i was at home cooking dinner for my family, and I get a phone call from the State Department saying, Dr. Lewis, congratulations, you are a Fulbright Scholar. So I emailed President Shalader immediately, and she replied very quickly to say, yeah, I spoke to Condoleezza Rice, and everything was taken care of. So again, make sure you know people. In, in, engage yourself with leadership. I think it's a very, I didn't, my, my, uh, success in getting a Fulbright was not because strings were pulled, but I had got the Fulbright, I would cut because of budget, and then because I knew people, I could get back into the system. So I think engaging yourself in leadership. So I was, uh, I became a Fulbright scholar. I came back from that sabbatical, um, as Dr. Lebowski made me whole for the whole time, I came back and he asked me to be the residency program director, the largest program in the country. I did that for several years, and then the dean asked me to work in his office as the senior associate dean for graduate medical education. So now I'm building up a portfolio of leadership experiences, engagement in, uh, in the institution. At the same time, I had served as the president of the State Society of Anesthesiology, so you could get an, a regional reputation. But I really wanted to be a chair. And so I applied for two chairs in Florida at that time, one at the Mayo Clinic Jacksonville and one at the University of Florida Jacksonville. And I was offered both. I took the University of Florida Jacksonville job. And we uh, started there in uh, July of 2013. Had a remarkable relationship, both with my dean and my CEO. And we were doing extremely well. And then after about a couple of years, they sent me to Harvard they have a course for new chairs. And I went there and my study partner was from Henry Ford. And we were studying together and he said, hey Mike, why don't you come and join the uh, faculty at Henry Ford? And I used some very colorful language to say, I live in Florida, why would I move to Michigan? Uh, and then the next lecture was on quality improvement at Henry Ford. And I thought this was too weird. So I sent a letter in of, of interest Cut a long story short, in October 2015, we ended up here. And there's no magic to this. There's a formula for success. One is you have to be present. A chair must lead from the front. You can't say charge to people. You have to say, follow me. So we, did, we worked on, I met, was very lucky to have very good relationship with some of the people I'd worked with in the past, we recruited a good team of leadership. The department, which had been in a poor situation prior to us arriving, um, lack of faculty has now fully staffed. We had an engagement, national engagement score in the 15th percentile on our arrive. Now we're in about the 90th percentile. We've built an education program that's second to none. We've begun to develop a scholarly activity program that's second to none, and we have very clear finances and, and management love good finances. That's, they, they love good academics, they love uh, good teaching programs, they love good research, but they love good finances. And so we've built um, a narrative, a compelling narrative of leadership and people want to be on our team. And so we have a waiting list of people to join our team. So those are some of the initiatives that I introduced.
That's an amazing journey. Thank you for sharing that with us. Now, as the chair and the leader of the program, what advice do you have for the graduating residents and fellows entering the professional and job market for the first time? It's a very good question. And uh, I must say that I have paid forward from the mentorship that I have got, and I actually have mentees all around the country and back around the world. People call me all the time for career advice. So when a resident comes to see me, my first thing is, you have to go where your passion is. You're going to be spending the rest of your life doing whatever you're doing. So when you go to select your fellowship program, if you're going to select fellowship, go where your passion is. The second thing is choose a geographical area that you're going to feel happy in because it's likely that where you train for your fellowship is where you're going to settle in that region. Or if you're applying for a private practice job, make sure that that area is an area you're going to feel comfortable with. You possibly have social support in that area because once you start having a family, life can get pretty hard. Um, so carefully choose the geographical area that you want to be a good partner. Always be that person who's willing, who says, yes, how can I help rather than no. No shouldn't hardly enter into your vocabulary. Always be the person who drives the business or the enterprise forward. Those are the kind of things I'm advising. Now, given that this year we're dealing with the pandemic and a lot of the annual conferences have been done virtually or online, what advice do you have for the graduating class regarding their networking and outreaching process now that they don't have the ability to meet folks like yourself at meetings? So that, that is an extremely good point. And so we've reached a hiatus where people, um, people have a problem. They can't meet with people. They can't socialize with people. They can't interact. So the first thing is, and this, thankfully, at the, the generation after me is very good at, is the social networking. Be productive in your social networking because um, whatever you put online is how it defines you. So there are instruments like Doximity, that like uh, LinkedIn, that are professionally shaped uh, social networks. And even Facebook, uh, if you are a professional and you don't put destructive stuff on Facebook, uh, it's a useful tool just to meet people. And you, look, and you look for people. You have to actively search for people. And people often approach me on Facebook, on LinkedIn, and ask me about jobs and stuff. And I open up engagements with people. And I either say yes or I direct them towards other people who can help. So I would think social networking. The second thing is, especially if you're planning to uh, train in the geographical area where, to practice in the geographical area where you train, is to physically get on your bike and go to visit those sites and say, can I hang out for a day, get to know people, so they see who you are. Um, and then I, I've done a lot of, because I do have great connections around the country, I pick up the phone for people uh, and try and introduce them that way. Uh, and that's a very useful tool. But it is challenging, you're right, and identifying that. Um, and if you're on an online conference, guess what? Get up and ask a question, make people notice you in the conference the same way as you would at a regular conference we hope you enjoyed this episode of interview with the surgeon until next time stay focused and keep following your dreams